Yeah, sure, we can dive in. Okay, so uh, first, uh, thank you all for joining. Um, you might notice my voice sounds a little weird. I'm like super sick right now. So I'm going to do the first couple of slides and kind of introduce what we're going to talk about. And then I'm going to turn it over to Bobby uh, to drive the rest of the meeting. Um, oh yeah, Bobby, you want to go to the next slide? Great, thanks. So we started this last time. Um, I wanted to start the meeting with a short thing about um, inclusivity. Um, I got this idea when I was at a workshop at Supercomputing, and they were talking about building more inclusive uh, software development environments. And one of the things they talked about was at the beginning of a meeting, have a short minute to talk about something about um, inclusivity or diversity. Um, I was trying to do something that was somewhat related to the project that we're working on. Um, and one of the things that I heard about at this uh, um, workshop that really caught my ear was thinking about accessibility, um, especially for people who have like um, uh, vision impairment. So I think it's an interesting to think about th thing to think about with developing Gym Five. Like, what if you had a vision impairment? How would you use Gym Five? Um, I think there's a lot of things in our project that would make it very difficult. Um, so maybe as we're going through our development, um, we can kind of be thinking about things we could potentially do uh, to improve the accessibility of Gym 5. So, you know, for instance, I think a lot of the Gym 5 output is would not be very um, friendly to screen readers. The stats.txt file is a great example of that. Trying to find the stat that you're looking for is difficult, e e even when you don't have um, any kind of vision impairment. Um, you know, we work hard on documentation, but the accessibility of the documentation is not there. Um, we don't have alt text on a lot of things. Um, I've never tried to use the website with a screen reader, but my bet would be that it didn't work very well. So that could be another thing that we um, put some effort into. Um, and then just generally, um, I think it's, uh, it made my mind work a little bit different when I started hearing about these things, about trying to improve accessibility. And uh, it, it's, uh, something to think about as we're developing these important research tools um, in case researchers in our community have um, you know, visual impairments or something. Okay, next slide, Bobby. Okay, so I wanna make a couple of quick announcements. One is the Gym 5 Bootcamp. We finally nailed down specific dates. So we're gonna do, we did a bootcamp in 2022 where we had about 50 people all come to Davis. Here's a picture of us. Um, and we spent an entire week of deep dive learning how to use Gym 5. Um, so we have dates for this year, which are going to be July 29th to August 2nd. Um, it's going to be here at Davis again. We're going to have a bigger room this time. We're still working out specific number of attendees and what the costs are going to be, but I expect to at least double the number of attendees from what we had before. So before we had about 50, I expect at least about 100 uh, slots for attendees this year. Um, for those of you who are working at companies, uh, which I see a few of you uh, in the guest list, I'm going to start bugging you for sponsorships. Um, we'd really like to sponsor some travel grants. Uh, I think this is a really high impact thing uh, that these companies can do. Um, by sponsoring a travel grant to get some students to come to this, you're really training up the students so they can come work for your companies and do great things. Last time in 2022, uh, we opened this only to students, although I had a number of professionals reach out wanting to attend. Um, this year, we will open it to professionals as well as students. Um, and if you sponsor, if your company sponsors, we'll make uh, some number of slots available to you for free as well. Um, along with this, I'm not sure how many people um, in the room are part of, uh, we got a big, a uh, piece of funding from NSF, the CSSI grant. Um, and we'll be having a meeting for uh, the CSSI uh, participants sometime around this um, in person at Davis. Any questions on that or comments? Okay, next slide, Bobby. Yeah, uh, I can talk a bit about this because I'll be running this event at uh, HPCA. So uh, we put a full day slot at HPCA to do a Gem5 tutorial. Uh, we've done these before, but I believe we've only ever been extended for half day events, even though we've always asked for a full day. 
So this is the first time I have a full day tutorial uh, at a Buddha Architecture Conference, at least the first time in a while. Uh, and for anyone who's going to HPCA, that's Saturday, that's the first day, which I believe is March 2nd of the event. And uh, so Gem, uh, so we just talked about the boot camp, which is over five days and trying to get people from 0 0.0 to 100% know how to use Gem 5 over five days. This is me trying to do exactly the same thing pretty much in one day. It's a crash course, uh, assumes no prior experience. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can just turn up and we'll start off with the basics over the course of, I guess, my six hours ish. We'll build you up to uh, kind of know how to create sim objects and uh, extend Gen 5, maybe, maybe even add your own instructions and modify things in that capacity. Uh, so it's well worth going to. Uh, uh, and for people who are more experienced who use Gen 5 on a day-to-day -day basis uh, or have used Gen 5 before in some, uh, some uh, capacity, we do try to ensure that we cover uh, kind of a bias towards the newer features in Gen 5 so they're exposed and uh, we can show, show them off and show people how to use them. So it's also good as a kind of refresher course for anyone who happens to be attending the conference uh, or you can send your students there, that's fine as well. So uh, over the next... I guess it's going to be over the next month. I will be uh, basically flat, 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 flatting this out. Uh, and if you're going to HPCA, uh, register for this event. I just think registration is soon, if not now. Uh, and uh, I'll see you there. Uh, if anyone has any questions on that, feel free. Uh, Great. Thanks, Bobby. Also, this is the first time in. I think six years that we've had a Gym 5 event in Europe. Yeah, yeah this the is UK is part. considered Europe still. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, for, for, for anybody in Europe, this is a good uh, opportunity. Okay, so now let's dive into uh, what we want to spend most of the time in this meeting talking about, which is a plan for Gym 5 version uh, 24.0. Um, in the past, we haven't done a great job of setting out a roadmap. Um, we've tried to do some things, but I think that this ha having these meetings will make it much easier uh, to set out a roadmap. So I'm going to turn it over to Bobby, and he's going to talk about some of the things that we are planning on doing for 24.0 here at Davis. And then we will turn it over to anybody uh, in the meeting who wants to talk about what their goals are uh, for 24.0. Yeah, so I just said these goals for UC Davis... Uh... They are somewhat flexible. We're always looking to try to provide the best features for the community, though a lot of these do fit into our research agendas here as well. So we do also have a slight uh, inclination towards them. Uh, but we're just trying to get the best use of our time here to get make Gen 5 the best as possible. So obviously, as with all uh, projects, there's a limited bandwidth to develop for power here. Uh, but to go through the things that we're certainly strongly considering putting in in this uh, version of Gen 5, which by the way is probably you're thinking about a four-ish month time frame here of development time, uh, maybe maximum six months. Uh, so this is sort of what we're thinking to get in here. Uh, first of all, general improvements to Gen 5 standard library. That's this kind of ongoing thing. Um, basically, as long as people are still using se.py and fs.py, the standard library isn't up to snuff. Uh, we and we're well aware of that. If there's stuff that you, you can't do in the standard library, we're trying to find the engineering time to implement it inside the standard library. So we want that to be the standard supported, well-tested way to improve Gen 5. So that's ongoing. And uh, if anyone's got any nice ideas, what could be in the standard library, if there's some stuff coming up on these sites, then please reach out. I'm all, I'm kind of all ears in that front. One thing we're thinking of definitely getting in this frame, uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, versus Gen 5, it's a Gen 5 orchestration for, for framework, which uh, I'm calling Jeff. Um, so what I mean by orchestration framework, I was familiar with um, things like Kubernetes that manage uh, basically virtual machines and things like this. Uh, that's sort of what we're meaning, but for Gen 5. So our experience working with uh, researchers who use Gen 5 is uh, you, you inevitably need to spin up lots of Gen 5 instances to run any meaningful experimental agenda. And that normally just means uh, someone's wrote a bash script somewhere that uh, spins up about 50 instances of Gen 5, and they all run, they all output to a different output directory, and then at the end you look at the output direct directory and see kind of what you've got. And there's all stuff that can go wrong there. Just as something that happens continually in uh, like UC Davis, 
uh, the server might just go down uh, and suddenly you've lost about half of your experimental runs and it's hard to know which half you've lost, which half was done and things like this. Also, sometimes you just set up things slightly wrong in your in your Jetpack, uh, Jetpack uh, configuration and Jetpack stalls for some reason. And that's very, very hard to inspect Gen 5 and know whether it's stalled and whether or whether it's just taking a longer time than you expect. So what we our orchestration framework is, uh, it might not be one thing, it might be multiple tools, but certainly the concept is a framework in which uh, multiple Gen 5 instances can run and be inspected and managed in an organized way. So this is a little overlap. If anyone here has been around in the project long, long enough to remember the Gen 5 art project, there's a lot of overlap here, but we want something a bit more standardized. So there's various things you, we can put into a framework like this. Uh, there, there's a link and uh, on this slide, and actually probably people would like, like this slide, but if you go into the uh, discussions page on the Gen 5 GitHub, there is a, a discussion about this, about what should be in this or should be in this orchestration framework. So one thing I'm quite keen on is um, there should be better tooling to inspect Gen 5 processes. Uh, so as a basic idea, we should be able to have some tooling to point to a specific Gen 5 process and say, hey, what's the uh, what's the ticks per second here? Are we still running? Are we still ticks per second? Hey, what's the instructions per second? Hey, some sort of uh, using those metrics, can we infer whether the process is stalled? Things like that. Another one I would see, it should be easy to kind of suspend the Gen 5 process and then restart it up from some stored memory, memory, which is quite handy if you have to like shut down your machines or whatever. But also on top of that, I think it'd be quite good that let's say every 10 minutes you store the state of a Gen 5 process. So if your machines do die or something happens, you can easily restore from them. So that's the sort of thing I would like to see in a Gen 5 orchestration framework. Uh, other things here as noted on these slides is better support for parallel sim parallel simulation. So in the last release of Gen 5, that is 23.1, which you can get from stable, um, we can we have these things called suites, and suites is just, as you might imagine, it's a suite or collection of applications that are you can run to ver to test a simulated system. So essentially it's just a set of for all intents and purposes, a set of tests. And we would like uh, a user Gen 5 tool to pass that suite into, a, let's say, a configuration, and it spins up X processes, one for each one of those tests, and runs them all in parallel. And at the end, it gives you all the results the same one, uh, which is quite handy. It saves you up to write all these bash scripts. You'd also organize, it, organize the output to correct directories in the correct format and things like this. Um, so we are definitely all ears and anyone who's got any ideas in that front. The more we can move away from people having to, again, write these giant bash scripts that spin up a million processes and things never go wrong, the happier we are. Part of that agenda to make things a little bit more organized is um, exit events. What I mean by the exit events are things that happen inside a Gen 5 simulation to exit the simulation loop. Uh, right now, those are just stringed. Basically, how it works, how it, how it literally works really is when that happens, a string is passed back to the Gen 5 tool. Uh, and that's the, all, that's the only information we have about this exit event that occurred. Uh, which just isn't very rich, isn't very useful, it doesn't really give very much information at all. I mean, there's lots of string parsing going on in Gen 5. So we want to make that better by having Gen 5 return actual objects as part of these exit events. And that's going to feed more kind of into the Gen 5 orchestration framework as well. So when the simulation loop does exit, we can manage that better via the orchestration framework. You can see, hey, this. Um, Process number 85 exited its simulation loop due to uh, maybe an error, or it exits simulation loop due to our work begin starting and now we're setting up something else. You know, we can get we can get more rich information about what's going on inside the simulation loop via these uh, richer exit event objects. Um, uh, related to the standard library, uh, we want to have a GPU board. So there's so one of the great successes of Gen Five in the last, I'd say two or three years, uh, has been the addition of uh, basically GPUs to simulate. Uh, but right now they're uh, not incorporated into the standard library and supported via config scripts and examples configs. And you know that's fine uh, for some purposes, but 
Uh, it means you can't use a lot of the Gen 5 infrastructure there that we've built up over the past, over the past few years. So uh, what we want to do here is create a GPU board that's like a, that'd be like an x86 board or ARM board, all these other boards we have. Uh, so it allows you to take a GPU system and we can swap in and out memory or swap in out different processors, swap in out different cache hierarchies if we need to, and also a standardized way to load disk images and kernels. Uh, so it should give them better uh, interface to uh, basically play with GPU with, uh, with a GPU inside Gen 5. Uh, certainly want to move away from Right now, if you want to run an SE mode in Gen in for these GPUs, you have to run everything inside this Docker container, and it's all very you have to manage it very carefully and for the bulk movement. Also related, uh, somewhat to standard live, we want to improve power models. So I feel like every, I would say about every month, someone goes to the mailing list and asks about power about power models in Gen five, and uh, I think our response to that has been, I don't know, no one's worked on this in a while. Um, <laughs> Partially motivated by research grants, we've got the required knowledge of power consumption. Uh, we're revamping the power models in Gen 5, uh, various aspects of that, but we hope by version 24.0, we have power models that are usable and uh, useful for people who want to measure power estimates inside Gen 5. Uh, it's mostly run by the University of Wisconsin, but as a Davis have some responsibilities as well. Uh, the last uh, slide here, last bullet point here is uh, we want to simulate uh, a high a, a high performance ARM service at server uh, such as a Neoverse N1. Uh, so in the Java standard library, you have the concept of pre-built boards. So uh, a not pre-built board is like a x86 board. You can swap in and out of the memory any memory you want, swap in and out processors, any, any like processor you want, swap in and out the cache hierarchy and various other things. It's very flexible. A pre-built board is just, no, this is the board. You can't really configure very much. What is configurable is very constrained to realistic uh, parameters. Uh, but we have, but we try to, but the board comes with certain guarantees of correctness and uh, fidelity to the real world counterpart. So that's what we mean by pre-built board in this case. And we think for this release, we want to create an ARM server uh, that's pre-built and can run ARM server simulations that are reasonably high quality. So that's one of our agenda for uh, Continued here with uh, our general ideas, what we would want to get in this get in, in the next few months. Uh, improvements to Gen 5 resources. Uh, this is this is kind of one of these ongoing efforts. It doesn't quite ever end, but if we release it, gets slightly better. <laughs> um, so the big thing here is disk images. Um, we have, I would say maybe like eight relatively useful disk images inside Gen 5 resources, such as uh, NAS parallel benchmarks, uh, gaps, uh, things like that. So they're just disk images containing benchmark suites uh, that you can run inside your Gen 5 simulations. We also have some uh, Linux kernels. Um, Generally, these are decent, but they have lots of limitations. Uh, I think the biggest one here is that second sub bullet point is uh, I think with the really one or two exceptions are all x86 uh, because we've had some uh, basically making ARM or RISC-V disk images has proven a bit well, but harder than x86 disk, uh, disk images. So we want to move away from that and have a bigger ISA spread here. There's also kind of a lack of standardization in these disk images. So a big thing here is uh, when I talked earlier about the exit events, that is events inside a simulation that exit the simulation loop. Uh, there's really very little standardization in, in these disk images about when that happens. So in some, we have a work begin exit event at various interesting points inside a, a benchmark suite application. And other ones we kind of don't. Uh, we want to have much more rich standardized disk images. So I've, we were thinking things like, uh, you know, an exit event when the kernel's booted. And by the way, an, an exit event can be completely ignored if you want to, which in this case, I think it mostly would be. So once your kernel is kernel's completely loaded, you have an exit event. And then once you are to login screen, you have another exit event. And when, you're at, when your benchmark begins, you have an exit event. When your application starts, you have an exit event, things like this and various other sort of uh, exit events. We also want to have exit events that just really errors more 
better from the simulation as well. So it's like, oh, this we had a complete crash at this point in the simulation. Okay, return me the exit event and give me the every single piece of data you have on that. So that's going to be a part of like this is a cross between the exit event agenda and improving gen five resources disk images. Uh, again, this is one thing, and we say anything else here. Uh, we're kind of all ears on what sort of stuff people want from disk images. Uh, one thing we will say, I will say, I will think, I think the audience here is pretty much aware of this, is uh, no, we're not going to create a disk image for every single person who's got every single research agenda ever. Uh, I think I'm endlessly swamped with uh, emails asking me to create disk images for people and my general response is no, because uh, it's it takes a lot of effort. But we hope to have uh, disk images to cover all the usual, all the common and commonly used benchmark suites and things like this. Uh, really try to cover ninety percent of the cases with instead of, uh, and with that also we hope to provide develop. I would say tooling, but it might not be necessarily the form of a tool. Maybe just well written tutorials on how you build your own disk images as well. So that's kind of also part of the parts as well. So if anyone's got any suggestions or ideas on that, please let me know. Uh, big thing, our thing is we're really ramping up SST integration into Gen 5, as well as multi-node and CXL. Uh, basically, the reason for that is we've got grants that kind of necessity uh, our usage of SST to get data, data that we need. But of course, like a lot of our grants and funding we have in Gen 5, uh, we hope this is of great use to most other people in the project as well. The SST bridge has been well, up until I think a year and a half ago, I don't think it was working at all after basically being dead code for a while, but it working again. It's still a bit flaky. It doesn't work at all. Definitely doesn't work in all use cases. It's got a lot of limitations. We're slowly squeezing out these limitations, trying to find solutions where you can almost run any any, any simulation you want with SST and Gen 5. So that's an agenda for the coming months. Other two smaller things here is website updates and improvements. Uh, I'm a little bit embarrassed about how I how I will update some of the documentation is on the website. Uh, I think everyone here are just standard engineers who love to engineer, but we don't necessarily like to write any documentation or tutorials on how any of our stuff works. Uh, but we really want that in the coming release to have some decent web-based tutorials and information on Dem5. Um, that's also runs into our, our bootcamp and our tutorial coming up. Like we want to revamp a lot of our materials that we share and give out uh, to the community to make sure they're really uh, up to snuff. Uh, and Python documentation as well. So we have Doxygen, we have some C++ doc, uh, documentation, but the Python side of Gen 5 is really growing. Well, I would argue the Python side of Gen 5 is growing a bit faster than the C++ side. And we do uh, enforce uh, where necessary the use of these uh, doc strings. And there's various tools out there to turn these doc strings into rich documentation, web-based documentation. So we're, 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 we 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 people here working on that uh, kind of two two kind of uh, things going on: improving the doc the Python documentation a little bit, and also just making sure that it's available online, it's indexable. So hopefully, people Google questions in Gen Five, uh, they get better answers, and they don't have to dive into the source code as much. Uh, I'm also hoping some chat GBT sort of stuff starts to parse these uh, websites and actually can give answers to people instead of uh, bothering us with their questions. Uh, so that's another thing. Uh, this, I think, is the last slide on ideas we had. Uh, yeah, these, these, these are things that we need, uh, we would like help with, essentially. Um, there's really three things here. Uh, the first is the Clang format. Uh, I hope no one has much to say about this this meeting because it feels like whenever this comes up, it's a impossible discussion where people argue over things like line lengths uh, ad nauseum. Uh, but essentially, it'd be really uh, my pitch here is this: I personally don't care what format is chosen. I would just like a automatic formatting tool for C plus plus. I would like it in soon, so we can just automate this process and dedicate less time to. Well, twofold. First of all, actually, when we reviewed code, we can have confidence that it's through the for to our formatting standard and without having to kind of manually check things so often. And secondly, by almost uh, what about almost um, enabling clang, clang format, we are defining our uh, coding style guide by that 
by that clan format spell guide. That is, if it passes clan format, then it's in, it, it, then it, it then it is in accordance to our style guide. We don't have to debate over uh, things as much anymore. Um, it'd be really nice if we get that in. Uh, last time when I tried to get us in, people had some input. Not saying any of the was wrong. I just means I have to go back and implement it. Uh, will be nice next time I go back and implement these things. We can get some rich feedback and maybe not too much bike shedding. Anyone can help me help me with that. Please go ahead. Uh, the Ruby multi protocol in a single binary. This is something I this is something I lack the expertise to do, but I really like how it was to do. So Gabe Gabe Black, I guess I guess Gabe did this about over a year ago now. Uh, did what I call the multi ISA improvement, which meant you can have multi multiple ISAs inside a single gen type binary, which was like 75% of the problem. The problem being uh, to you have to compile to the used to be you have to compile to the ISA you want and the uh, Ruby protocol you you may want. Otherwise, you can't really use Gen5. Uh, we're very, very close to having a single Gen5 binary that does everything almost. Uh, it just requires uh, this problem to be resolved. Uh, we would like, yeah, a single binary with all Ruby protocols in it and all ISAs in it. And I think that would be a great thing. It would mean we can distribute Gen5 as a binary to classes and things like this, and not require as much tool to compile. You're always, not, not, not obviously, you're always going to need to compile Gen5. But for the foreseeable future, many people will have to compile Gen5 because modifying the source is how you do a lot of stuff, but for definitely education purposes and things like this, it'd be great if we could just have this all in binary. If anyone wants to help with that, please reach out, jump in. Jason can do it, but he's absolutely swamped this semester uh, being an educator, sadly. I would love him to be more of an engineer, but that's the career he chose. Uh, I kind of lack the expertise in this. If anyone's a Ruby expert, then please reach out. Uh, and the fetch directed instruction prefetching, uh, again, this is not something I'm an expert on, uh, and I don't think anyone at UC Davis here is or has a bandwidth to do so, but if anyone wants to help with that, then please reach out. We would love help with this uh, as well, and we'd love to get it into version, 20, version 24 this year. So that's essentially uh, all the slides I've had. So again, this is just really what we've been talking about here at UC Davis. Uh, and my general message is, uh, this is a time if you have any ideas what you'd like to see in Gen 5 in the coming release. Uh, you don't have to mention them in this meeting, but I'd say mention them soon because uh, we really have to allocate resources towards things we want to do. Uh, but with that, uh, I'm happy to open the floor to anyone who has anything to say uh, or any input to have. As always, if you don't want to say anything in this meeting, you can. I would recommend making a comment on this, the, on the, on this uh, meetings discussion page in, in the GitHub, but it's up to you as well. You can use other channels. So, I think we can see. Oh, I see the chats, but like 10, 10 chats now. Cool. Uh, J, uh, did anyone say anything? Have a question here? No. I mean, does anyone have any? Everyone want to raise their hand in this chat and talk? So I have a comment sure. and it relates to the disk image generation. Mm -hmm. um, it might be inaccurate, but I've seen in the past that uh, some of the disk images that we are actually generating are actually like used for multiple purposes. And uh, sometimes we ship like a fully fledged Ubuntu distribution. Um, and uh, this is okay in case like someone actually has the time to boot everything, take a checkpoint and then run some studies. Uh, the other, the problem is that I've seen it used also for uh, Linux boot testing and that like can really take lots of time. Um, I believe that in ARM, at least in the test, in the old tests we are running on Linux boot, we really use like a cut down version for testing so that you really have um, atomic um, atomic boot in like two to three minutes um, because it's really quick. So I think that's something that is worth discussing and not just testing versus like a, a normal usage, like running a workload, I guess like considering uh, some middle grounds 
like uh, and shipping different kind of uh, disk images, um, a fully fledged one, then a light a lightweight one, and uh, but still used for like running some uh, workloads, and then another one, a really minimal one, uh, used for testing. Something that uh, you might even have like um, um, M five exit baked uh, um, in the in ITRMFS, for example, uh, something like this. Yeah. So, I, that, so sorry that that's all great, Giacomo. Um, Ivana, maybe, or somebody, I know there's a link to a discussion page that has these details, but where we were flushing out some of these things exactly like this. Could someone please po put that in the chat for me? Um, yeah, all, all, all that are great suggestions, Giacomo. I think 75% of what you said is covered already in this discussion. If someone could put the link in the chat for me, um, mm -hmm. but the other 25%, it would be really great if you could update that um and, and put those ideas down and i'd also say it's kind of related to what you said i mean you said it because i was beginning but um i think when we start to standardize what these disk images mean i would also like to provide checkpoints with these disk images that bring you to you know that kind of solve that problem as well so um yeah i agree that we have several disk images we call boot, boot tests or boot, boot images or something but they all do it slightly differently so I think um, standardizing that process would certainly be helpful. Um, cool. Has uh, anyone got anything else? Yeah, yeah. For, and you're free to comment on anything that we plan to do as well. It doesn't just be anything that. Happy to leave this meeting early. Uh, that's fine. Okay, it doesn't seem like anyone's got any additional thing to say. That's fine. Sorry, uh, I, oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. I, oh, yeah, sorry. I have a quick question. Sorry. So I just wanted to know what the sorry. This is Pranit. Uh, I recently uh, started looking at Gem Five. Uh, I had a quick question about uh, <clears throat> checkpoints and sim points. Uh, I look for documentation online, and uh, there were some references to automatically taking SIM points and how to uh, restore or rerun from those SIM points. But uh, I couldn't really uh, find uh, on uh, find uh, references on how to do that. So I was curious what the current status for SIM points is on how to generate SIM points and how to run. Uh, status of SIM points, as far as I remember, is it's it's been implemented. I believe it's still working. If you look in configs examples, Gem5 library, I believe there's some sim point, if not loop point code. Uh, and uh, in its terms of being automated, that's where I draw the line. It's not, I don't think it's completely automated. It requires a lot of manual, a very uh, particular configuration to get these sim points when you actually want them and uh, things like that. So it's if you have uh, more questions about that, I would encourage you to post on the Slack. I'll say Jean Tong, who's in this meeting, has written most of the most recent SimPoint stuff. So she'll respond to you if you post on Slack. Um, and also the recent tutorial at ISCA this year. River Montreal was, was ISCA or HPCA? Must have been HPCA then. Yeah. Uh, HPCA in Montreal. Uh, we have some uh good documentation there too. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely some example configurations as well inside configs. Uh, the path I gave you might not be correct. But uh, yeah. yes. Uh, Zhang Tong is the person you want to ping on Slack if you see her. She basically wrote all this code. Okay. So, uh, is there is there any plan to standardize uh the sim points the exact same points for either uh, some of the benchmark suites so that, so I think I pointed, uh, I asked this on the Jumpfy discussion. I don't think there's any plans to do any of that immediately. You so I, I'll just say for spec, the problem is the license for spec. We, we just like, can't do anything because of the stupid spec license. No, for, except for the ISO, right? The rest of the infrastructure can be shared, right? So, I mean, uh, let's say- No, no, uh, uh, sorry. I've talked to the spec people about this. Mm -hmm. They've shot me down every time. It's just not easy for us to distribute. No, you you don't distribute their the. No, yeah, we, yeah, we, 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 we know exactly what you're saying. We, you don't have to distribute 
deploy disk images to be yeah. in, in violation of their license. Like not yeah, just... so you just drop in the disk image and the no, rest. No, 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 we were saying you you we can you can violate the spec license just by make, just by creating sim points and nothing else. Uh, that's just what they tell us, and we don't want to get in trouble, so we don't do it. Oh, so even the point at which your sim point starts, even that is a what, so, the, so the pro okay. Let's take this offline. Yeah. This is but yeah, but th that that is the reason we don't want to get sued, right? Just, you can take our word for that. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Um, does anyone have anything else? Uh, otherwise, yes. Please reach out if you have anything to contribute or ask or whatever. Uh, the next meeting will be the second Thursday of February, I believe. But we'll get back to you more on that in the next meeting. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending, uh, as always. And uh, let's make this a great release of Gen Live. Okay. Anyone who wants to help, please reach out. <laughs>